Next, we have a panel, Building Democracy on Blockchain. Your moderator, Rachel Wolfson, blockchain journalist for Forbes and the Merkle, the Entrepreneur Magazine's influential women in blockchain. Please welcome Rachel. Panelist, Dimitris Vasiliadis, lead business and product development at Exis, text expert evaluator at EU Commission. Please welcome Dimitris. Johanna Mosca, CEO of Global Situation Room Incorporated, ex-head of White House Press Advance for President Barack Obama. Please welcome Johanna. Mark Blick, head of government and blockchain technology at De Degenix. Please welcome Mark. Herb Stevens, Silicon Valley entrepreneur, co-founder and treasurer at Democracy Earth Foundation. Please welcome Herb. And Dmitry Matskovich, CEO and co-founder of DBrain, listed in the 100 people to watch in the chatbot space by VentureBeat. Thank you. Enjoy the panel. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining our panel, and I hope you all are all enjoying Vegas. This is a great conference so far, and there's lots of great people here to meet, so glad to see you all here. Um, today, we're going to be talking about building democracy on the blockchain, um, so it should be a very interesting discussion. And um, like they, they said, I'm Rachel Wolfson. I'm with Forbes. And uh, these are our great panelists, and I'll let them just briefly introduce themselves um, before we get started. Yeah. Okay, hi everybody, great to be here. I'm Dimitris Vasiliadis, I work for Exus, where I lead uh, product and business development uh, using artificial intelligence and blockchain to reinvent the debt collection and loan origination industries. Um, on a second note, I'm CEO and co-founder of Giving Streets, a startup that aims at bridging the cashless divide started off in London and expanding to the rest of the world. And thirdly, I am an expert advisor to the European Commission, evaluating ideas and new technological trends. Thank you. I'm Johanna Masca, CEO of Global Situation Room. Uh, we are a firm, a consulting firm, that works on global good, global trade, and global risk. Um, before that, I worked with President Obama. I was his director of press advance and traveled with him for uh, eight years to 42 countries. Hello, my name is Mark Blick. I work for a company called Diginex, which is based in Hong Kong with offices in Tokyo, Berlin, and Switzerland. Um, we focus on the full ecosystem of blockchain and, and, and crypto, but I specifically work with governments and NGOs on public sector work um, in partnership with companies like Agora to help drive free and fair elections globally, and NGOs like Mekong Club to help combat slavery um, with migrant workers across, um, across Asia. Hi, uh, my name is Herb Stevens. I'm one of the uh, co-founders uh, and directors of the Democracy Earth Foundation. We're a Y Combinator-backed nonprofit uh, in California, essentially building software using blockchains to improve democracy globally. Hey, my name is Dimitri. Uh, for the past 10 years, uh, I was engaged in artificial intelligence for enterprises. Uh, I sold several companies there, and in uh, the current company, I try to leverage blockchain uh, to democratize uh, artificial intelligence and to bring as many participants globally as possible. Okay, great. So let's start off the conversation um, by telling the audience what uh, democracy on the blockchain means to you. Thank you. Um, so I would like to backtrack a little bit um, and try to uh, re define democracy. Um, I'm happy of my Greek heritage in that sense, uh, in the sense that uh, democracy comes from two d Greek words, demos, that is public, and kras, uh, kratia, krasi, that is power, essentially meaning power to the people. So for me, democracy over blockchain is pretty much about reinventing the, the model of democracy that we have come to know at this point in age, uh, where we can actually get everybody to be fully engaged in the proceedings and be fully accountable uh, in the process. So it's not uh, just the electing and the voting part, which is very, very fundamental in the entire thing, but it's actually maintaining the engagement and the participation in the nature of the democracy following the uh, election results. Uh, and blockchain in that sense uh, can and shall be able to, to provide 
uh, and facilitate uh, aspects such as uh, accountability for citizens, communication, the ability to have options and express them freely, but also to, to be able to decide on things that matter to them. Uh, on a final note, for me, democracy, especially for uh, over blockchain, is an opportunity to bring uh, equality and inclusivity uh, for all uh, participants, citizens, and groups in that sense. That's um, following up on a lot of that. Uh, I agree. Um, backing up, um, my experience uh, is. Um, pretty intimate with elections. Um, I worked with President Obama on his first campaign, um, and I was in the White House on his second campaign. I also worked in state elections. I worked on a gubernatorial in Iowa and with a governor in Kansas. Um, so I come to it with both the experience of elections and then um, being in that position where then you've been elected and you want to engage your audience and you want to be able to keep going back to your constituency and reading how you're doing. Um, and so I have a, a perspective um, that may be unique because I've been in that position of trying to engage audiences when, engage, when the audiences are like, no, no, you got this. Um, so I'm sure we'll talk about that. Um, so I think elections um, look to serve two purposes. Uh, the first is to accurately and transparently declare the winner and choose who that person is. Um, and the second and equally critical purpose is to convince the loser. Um, and to the extent that an electoral process um, is not uh, in, uh, transparent and independently verifiable, it fails in that purpose. Um, I think that many of the conversations we've had across the world with policymakers, regula um, regulators, and, and governments, for the most part, there's a big desire to infuse the sense of trust back into the electoral process, which may have declined in, in let's say, the last decade, certainly. So you have in Africa, 38% of voters um, believe that n often or always that their votes are tampered with or excluded. And that sense of less loss of trust in the electoral process leads to a declination of voter participation. Um, in the UK, in the last three elections, general elections, the voter turnout has been at the lowest point since the 1930s. And then coupled with voter participation, you have a sense of voter apathy. Um, here in the US in 2016, only 56% of the population that was eligible to vote actually cast its ballot. And apathy in the electoral process doesn't necessarily mean apathy in the political process. So people may not want to go and take part in an election. But th that'll be manifested in protest groups, which, which may or may not be healthy for the overall running of the country. So when we look at blockchain and its ability to securely, transparently, auditably, permanently, and fairly store votes, and I think we'll come to, come to a lot more of this later, um, the overall mission is to enfranchise as many people as is humanly possible by allowing them to take advantage of a technology that for the first time, I think, um, allows them to do that. Thanks, Mark. Uh, I love the uh, in very international panel here. Uh, Democ Democracy Earth, we were actually founded in Argentina before we came to the United States. Uh, we still work around the world a lot more than we do here in the United States. But to answer the question, what does democracy mean uh, to, you know, relative to blockchains? First of all, I think it's very important to understand that uh, the United States is not a democracy. And that might surprise a lot of people. Democracy not once is mentioned in the US Constitution. And what we actually are is a republic. Uh, and at the state level, we're more of a democracy. Uh, but even then, um, what we've seen historically is a transition from the rule of one, a king, to a rule right now where we still exist at the rule of the 1%. So blockchains, to me, is, is actually moving to real democracy, which is ruling by the 100%. And I brought a book uh, today, and, and it just came out. Um, this is by Jason Hanania. Uh, Jason ran for US uh, 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 Senate in California uh, uh, in 2016. Uh, the book is called Architecture of a Techno-Democracy. And essentially what he lays out is how do we get from where we are now to a true democracy. And the bottom line there is accountability. And as an ex-auditor with GE for a number of years, for me, blockchains are about that. It's the accountability. The four things that you need for a democracy, he describes, Jason, as CODA. Communications, uh, 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 
um, uh, options, decisions, and accountability. And I would argue that we don't have those, any of those today, without blockchains, so therefore we don't have a democracy. Thanks. Um, yeah, uh, in our company we think a lot about that issue, uh, and I want to bring like, even like more higher level understanding what is democracy. Because we see that uh, democracy is then no any one stakeholder have too much power. So it's not, uh, it's not just about uh, like country level, it can happen on like industry level, company level, uh, your neighborhood level. So whenever some uh, entity or some stakeholder gonna accumulate too much power, that power gonna be abused. And it happens like everywhere. So democracy is uh, uh, kind of constraints which ensure that minority, those who have less resources, uh, less assets, uh, less control, have the same uh, right, the same inclusion. And there is so many dimensions. And uh, we in particular, in our company, we are focused on how to bring that inclusion to global workforce. Because, for example, in different regions like Nigeria, etc., uh, people can have less access to the global uh, financial market or global work opportunities, not just because some like totalitarian regime or any other advers adversaries, uh, they can have less access just because of lack of technology or lack of like communication channels or uh, for example, they enable to receive money for the work. So uh, I think they're like on a high level, democracy is uh, the ability to give that, to distribute that power uh, from majority to minority. So everybody have like the same access to resources, to rights, and to like every opportunity possible. Thanks. Yeah, so I think trust and transparency are two key factors here. How does blockchain enable this and bring that to democracy? Well, that's the, apparently the reason for being of blockchain. Uh, but the question here is, how is the implementation of a democracy of a blockchain is going to be 100% uh, original? And saying that, meaning that we've seen other areas of industry predominantly where we set about opening up assets, democratizing access to technology, and so on and so forth. And still, that resides within the few who control infrastructure, who control services, who control access to finance, and so on and so forth. So the main thing here is how can we get blockchain to truly become a, a tool uh, for the people and run by the people. Uh, and reaching to something that might up, uh, sound a bit radical because we know the technology is not that ready yet, not that mature yet. Um, but going to, to, to an environment where things are 100% uh, peer-to-peer. And I think it was Adam Smith 250 years ago in the Wealth of the Nations, who said that there is a magical way in which society appears to prosper when individual um, uh, uh, interests are being taken care of, where individuals focus on their own interests r rather than the interests of the majority of the groups. And this is funnily enough because we've reached a point uh, now talking about blockchains, talking about democracy, building trust over blockchain, where we've seen in many different parts of the world, Greece being a clear example of that, where people have actually lost the trust to the existing political systems and governments. So I think this also drives the potential for adoption and the opportunity here. The thing is, how big is the resistance to that chain, change is going to be? And who is going to be the main force of that resistance? 
You raise a couple good points. Um, you know, our, our, you're right in the sense of each state has their own secretary of state. They have their own method of voting. I saw it even, you know, caucus uh, process is entirely different than a primary process. It's extraordinarily complicated in America. And um, to the point where you're saying, you know, a, a lot of people have lost trust in it. I don't know that we've ever had a perfect point in our uh, country's history where everyone has trusted that the system has fully worked for them. I mean, women only won voting rights 98 years ago. Um, and, and at that point, most women's votes um, were still suppressed. Uh, there were uh, poll tests that are, were put in place. There were all sorts of ways in which to suppress minority votes. And so you have that disenfranchisement that we talked about earlier because people feel like they won't be heard. Um, so I, I've started um, talking to some of my colleagues who may even still remain in government who are implementing blockchain technologies in some of the government operations, whether at uh, the uh, GSA, which does all of the government uh, services or um, health uh, and human services. And um, a lot of what they like about it is that transparency, the multiple um, records, uh, those components are ones that could be very promising um, for elections. And I think what we're seeing is some of the states early adopting small, um, uh, you know, kind of uh, trials where they can see whether this will um, have effect such that the voters will trust. Um, and I think, you know, in most, in most instances, you're going to have a secretary of state who wants to win the trust of the people and they want the people engaged. And so I, I think if it can be built in a way where trust is not lost, you're gonna see it more quickly implemented than if um, something goes wrong at the early stages of uh, one of the, the trials, it, whether overseas or in the US, uh, and that trust is called into question. So I think trust is obviously critical um, in electoral process, and it's where our existing um, methodologies of, of conducting vote, uh, voting are failing us. Um, if we have the, the answer, which is we all think it's blockchain, and we look at the question of why are people losing trust in the electoral process? Um, and you can break that down into the myriad of problems that you have with, let's say, paper ballots, which can be double counted, they can be um, excluded. I think in the 2005 Egyptian election, international observers witnessed ballot boxes as being taken and discarded on the way to the central polling station. Um, the polling stations themselves, um, you have the question about the cost of them, the running of them, are they strategically placed to make sure that this group of people are more likely to vote than that group of people. Um, at, the security pol uh, at the polling stations, you also have question of security. Um, you have coercion, you have violence, you have bribery, um, and you have threats. Um, in Mali, 78% of voters say that they've been often or always offered a bribe at, at a polling station. Um, in the 2017 Kenyan elections, uh, the government had to spend $53 million on providing security for the just for the, the polling stations and also making sure that hospitals and doctors were ready because in, in previous votes it had been very violent. Um, you can look at electronic voting machines. Um, 31 countries have tried this. Um, most of Europe have stopped. Only 20 countries are still using them. In the US here, they're having to spend $1 billion just to overhaul the existing fleet. Um, these are very hackable. Um, I think just last month, a couple of 11-year-olds managed to hack into, into a voting machine in 15 minutes. Um, they're very expensive to run. Um, you're essentially outsourcing operation of your voting pr procedure to a third party vendor who has proprietary code um, that you don't necessarily have access to. Um, the operation of the voting machines on station, you're also probably outsourcing to people who have the technical know-how to do so because your average volunteer um, doesn't have that ability. Um, I heard recently also that on some voting machines, the glue is slipping. So when you think you're pressing one on the screen, you're actually pressing four. So in the context of all of this, um, whether it's votes, paper votes, hanging chads, um, ballot boxes going missing, um, people feeling as if they're being excluded, violence at polling stations, at the very best, coercion at polling stations. And coercion can be very simple. It can either be I'm a minority group and there was a majority group that wants me to vote their way, or it can be family and parental pressure. Um, you are a member of this household, you must vote for these people. 
Um, and then on top of that, electric voting machines, which I don't think have been particularly successful. So that's the question in why is there a loss in trust in the electoral system? And there we then have the answer of, of blockchain. And we believe that blockchain is able to, I mean, it's not the panacea and it won't solve everything, but it will start to systematically work it through many of those problems that we're currently faced at, facing in electoral procedures, which in many cases haven't changed for 100 years. Seems like we're going right down the line here, so uh, I'll chime in. Trust, obviously, trust is so important to democracy. But I would argue, and we're, we're, we're all here because of blockchains, right? Uh, the reason blockchains were invented is so you didn't need to trust a third party to come in and say, trust me, I've got this, or trust me, I've got your, your assets. And it goes for governments as well. We're not going to build, build trust uh, when it's in a centralized authority and it's, it's saying, trust me. I mean, we saw an announcement recently, the owner of the New York Stock Exchange, right? ICE, Intercontinental Exchange, uh, we, we all saw that. Um, I mean, it's laughable that here's the fox showing up at the hen house saying, trust me, I've got this. We bring more trust to the markets than anybody. And it's the real reason Bitcoin was created is so you don't have to trust these exchanges. I, I would argue in the next 10 years, exchanges go away right, including the crypto exchanges today, including the New York Stock Exchange, and in including NASDAQ and all these other exchanges. So we see ICE coming, and it's good for Bitcoin because they're going to create these products that support the price and the trading of Bitcoin. But as far as coming to the market saying, we're bringing trust to crypto or to democracy, total bullshit. Thanks. Yeah, but uh, I, I, I'm going to try to bring uh, the n not political perspective here because I'm really like not very like best person to speak about that. Uh, in, in our particular use case, uh, what we've seen that blockchain definitely like the best use case for blockchain is like trust provider. And what we've seen that whenever you have trust issue, usually you have a lot of connected costs to every trust issues. So uh, uh, the motivation to eliminate those trust issues is like, very straightforward. So, for example, uh, you need uh, some job, uh, like some work being done. And you try to find any particular like freelance, uh, whatever. You don't believe him. You try to research, uh, make background check, uh, develop some SLA. And you're going to spend a lot of uh, uh, bucks uh, for lawyers, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And the more you distrust to each other, the more those costs are going to be accumulated. So uh, it's it's funny, but democracy here it's like equal less cost because. Whenever you're gonna have like authority which gonna control uh, that uh, like transactions, that's gonna control that work being done correctly, etc. Uh, you're gonna have more and more and more costs uh, spending to that structure, and uh, vice versa. Uh, like in in our particular use case, whenever we try to eliminate every intermediary, every authority which need to control who, by what, at what price, and how what was done, you're going to eliminate a lot of costs. So in that sense, uh, trying to establish democracy, it's like the trend to have less costs and more efficiently, uh, like, uh, it's like uh, the path to more efficient money distribution. Um, let's focus a bit on blockchain-based voting systems now. Um, I know there are a few countries already testing this, like Russia and Crypto Valley and even West Virginia now. It was just announced that they're testing a blockchain-based voting system. Um, so where do you guys think that this can actually have the most impact in terms of regions and why? I'm happy to go first on that. Um, I, I think it... This is multi-layered, and it really depends on the question you're looking to solve for. Um, I tend to think blockchain is a solution to all problems, but if it's a cost perspective, um, you look at somewhere like the UK, which spent 15% of its $140 billion general election budget on just training volunteers for the polling stations. Um, if it's a security question, like we've seen in places in Africa, that has tremendous impact. Um, if it's a logistical question, so last year's India election took one month, nine rounds, 
of security forces going around the country to location to location because they were the only team who were really able to do it. In the 2014 Ukrainian election, it took 15 days from the end of polling to the announcement because of the, the, the tabulation process was just that long. Um, if it's a question around technological security and there have been questions in, in this country around that, then that, that's a different question too. So I think the, the impact is multi-layered and it's in many places. Um, I think the transparency that it brings to all governments is, is impactful for all. I think in, in those places where, um, I mean, the demo there are many democracies in the world. Um, I think there are 60 which can be categorized as authoritarian democracies. So they realize that there's, from an international perspective, an importance of having an election, but they have a vested interest in making sure they get the result that they want. Um, so I think in, in those situations where you can build a trustless mechanism, for allowing all members of society to have a vote um, that won't be coerced, um, that is economically affordable. Uh, to go back to your, your, your coda, um, I heard that the five criteria which should be minim minimally met for, for an election, transparency, so everybody um, should understand right from the beginning to the end what the process is, and having come up with a result, it has to be independently verifiable and auditable. Um, needs to be privacy, so um, each voter's choice has to remain private both during the election and after the election. It needs to have integrity. Um, only those people eligible to vote should be allowed to do so. And having voted, um, they shouldn't be open for alteration or exclusion. It should be affordable um, for both the, the government, the political parties, and the, and the participants in the election. And it should be accessible to all. Um, and anybody who's eligible to, to vote should be given reasonable access to polling stations or on their mobile phones or, or at home on their computers, whether they're from minority groups, live in rural mountainous regions, or, or disabled. So I think um, where it can be most impactful is where it impacts most of those points. Uh, I'll speak on that a little bit. Um, we've worked a lot in Latin America, uh, in Colombia. Uh, we're working in Venezuela. Um, I was recently at the Oslo Freedom Forum, um, put on by the Human Rights Foundation. Uh, if you haven't been to the Oslo Freedom Forum, I highly recommend it. Uh, it is sort of a white knuckle tour through the atrocities going on around the world firsthand. Uh, a lot of the stuff they talk about are half of the world that we don't live in democracies. I mean, we're lucky here in the United States, but when we're talking about uh, how blockchains and how democracy can be improved, we have to think about those places where government has basically broken down um, or they're fighting so much they'd rather kill each other. Uh, in Colombia, there were three parties to, to, to the election, the new government, the old government, and FARC. They all wanted to kill each other, so they needed a third party independent person that's gonna bring that trust and bring that technology to, to the platform. But let's keep in mind that a, a lot of the times we're not working with governments to provide the election uh, in, in, in infrastructure. We're actually working with the people or the groups that uh, are functioning in place of otherwise functioning governments. So that's why another reason why blockchains are, are so important because you don't have those institutions that are there to provide the democracy and that infrastructure, right? So it has to be mobile-based, it has to be blockchain-based, and it has to be uh, uh, something otherwise provided you know, not by the government. Right, and what about in terms of security vul vulnerabilities? Um, how does that tie into all of this? Uh, I can talk to that a little bit more just, just quickly. Uh, I, I think uh, as we've seen and as we're gonna continue to see that corruption exists at centralized databases. We're moving from a world where we have corruptible databases, and if, if you're a technologist and you understand databases, there are four basic functions, actions to a database. It's, it, the acronym is CRUD for another, for another acronym. Uh, create, read, update, and delete. In the blockchain world, you get rid of the uh, update and delete, and you only have create and read. So you're, we're literally moving from a corruptible world to an incorruptible world. So uh, relative to, and I think we've seen it with none of the blockchains being hacked, while most elections and a lot of the centralized databases are being hacked. Yeah. So in that sense, to, and to build on top of what Herb just said, um, that, that question reminds me of something that uh, a professor of mine uh, told the class like 20 years ago when we were talking about security of networks and communications. So I said, if it's built by humans, it can be broken down by humans. 
So eventually, you can only build that much uh, trust and security into the system. Um, and there is, uh, that, that's an, a never-ending struggle, eventually. Uh, the solution to that, and to make it as difficult for it to become yet another corruptible, let's say, solution, is to decentralize as much as possible. The greater the degree of uh, decentralization, the greater the, greater the uh, secure, let's say, result and operation of the, of the platform eventually. Yeah. And I would say, um, in terms of security, there's, again, it's multifaceted. So even you, what you were talking about is you can be coerced in person by someone, you know, so if you're a blockchain company and you're going in to do an election in, um, you know, a country that you may not be able to trust, and now you've got uh, people being uh, told at home because they're voting at home um, to vote for someone, and then the entire thing is called into question because of uh, problems that don't even have to do with your technology, that's going to actually be a risk for your company and for the continuation of um, blockchain technologies being built into uh, democratic systems. Um, and so I think that when we think about the technology, we need to think farther than the technology in terms of the improvements to the system that we need to make to ensure that privacy and to ensure every person is able to vote and vote once who is eligible. Um, and to that extent, you know, it's funny in America, um, I have a six-year-old and we were taking him to the polls one time and, and he was like, mommy, why do you vote on school days? And I was like, that's a really good question, Hugh. I mean, it does make it really hard for a lot of people to vote. And so, you know, I think what's necessary is a group of people coming together and looking at the best solutions um, and applying them in a really strategic fashion so that you can build that trust and have a free and fair election um, for the people. Right? <laughs> okay, great. So I think we have a few minutes actually for a bit of a Q&A. If anybody has any questions out there, we'll toss you this box. Um, go for it. <laughs> <laughs> Great throw. <laughs> yeah. that, was a, that was a good one. Yeah. <laughs> um, so the, you were talking a little bit about the Virginia incident. Um, they're doing some testing and voting. So there has, has actually got a lot of negative PR um, in terms of some security issues with the company involved with it. Uh, do you think that's a, is a technology ready right now for you know, blockchain-enabled voting? Or is this just a case of political climate and people getting their opinions of blockchain uh, mixed up in this whole discussion? Well, I'll just say two things. Um, you know, I think there's a lot of questions uh, about blockchain. We were talking earlier about, especially when cryptocurrency is thrown into the equation or they know it has anything to do with cryptocurrency. And there's a lot of like traditional politicians who will be like, whoa, 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 what are you doing? Um, and so that has to do with, uh, you know, there's going to be a backlash. Anything new, there's going to be a backlash. But I'm going to be excited and, and eager to follow um, how that election actually goes because we were talking about it backstage. And if it goes well, actually West Virginia could be a really great test bubble because um, if it works, uh, it's not in a state that um, would necessarily be seen as the most innovative. So it would be good. I, mean, I can comment on that a little bit as an observer. Um, I, I've read probably everything that you have. Um, as far as I understand, it was a very limited um, trial looking at overseas military uh, folks who were looking to vote. Um, it was very controlled. I think that there's, there's one guy in particular who appears in all the articles questioning the security aspect. Um, I think that's based on um, the potential security threat that this would have rather than um, on any knowledge that anything went wrong in this instance. Um, I think, again, if you look at what the, what the question is, in the 2016 election, there were 19,000 overseas votes that weren't counted. Um, over half of them were because it was, they were submitted too late. So if we're trying to solve a, that question of how do you enfranchise people who, I don't know, may be in a submarine at the time of polling, um, or just maybe far away from a US consulate, how do you solve for that? Um, as far as I'm aware, and this is just based on my online reading, the, the pilot was successful. Of course, there are still questions on security um, around if you're using mobile devices and then 
who controls the technology of those mobile devices and how secure are they. Um, I'd be, if you've got any articles you can share that show there were specific problems with this case, I'd, I'd be very happy to read them because it's very interesting. And I agree on your point, it's, it's a wonderful test case. And I think they were planning to, in stage process, continue this rollout across um, more of West Virginia. I'll make one comment, uh, and that's that we're early. Uh, yeah, I, I know we hear that, but what does that mean? I think technically, in a lot of ways, we're here as far as being able to conduct votes on blockchains and whatnot. But when you look at a lot of the democratic processes, in San Francisco, for example, they're using technology that is proprietary. They had a 10-year contract. They've kicked the can down the road three or four years. And so it's just a decision-making process, and that's going to take a couple of years. Just a city of San Francisco, I mean, if you think about the heart of Silicon Valley, and they should be one of the fastest to implement this type of stuff. Even there, it's going to take a couple of years just to get through the the, let's call it the democratic uh, local process. But uh, I, I think that, again, we're going to see, depending on jurisdiction, faster implementations. We're not really waiting on technology too much, but we're going to see places where democracy and, and is, is really needed uh, uh, probably implemented a lot faster than in the states where they're established and they have low, you know, slow processes. Okay, I think we're out of time. So thank you everyone for joining us and thank you to our panelists and to Cointelegraph and everyone here. So thanks. Huge round of applause for the panelists on building democracy on blockchain. Thank you.